Hi, Kim. I'm so happy to have you on the Arthritis Life podcast today. Hi, I am so excited to be here. I've been looking forward to this for months. Yes. And thank you so much for coming, even though I know your health has been very up and down lately, meaning the last couple of days, but also the last <laughs> lifetime. So yes. can you just yeah, start off by telling the audience just a little about yourself, like where you live and some of your health challenges? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Kim. I am originally from a very small town in Illinois down in the cornfields, but I now live in Charlotte, North Carolina down in the South. So small town to a big city. So my health things, these are so funny and difficult to describe. And I cannot wait to like dive into these deeper. So my three big diagnoses, like big umbrellas that I have right now that I is so funny. I have searched for these for years and actually just decided to give up right before I got them all. (laughs) So they are first one, a um, rheumatoid arthritis, and we'll be digging into that later. Uh, Next one is hypokalemic periodic paralysis, which is a very rare genetic disease where my potassium in my blood system drops and my muscles stop responding. So I get paralyzed. And the third is just some kind of fussy connective tissue disorder where all I know is you're from a surgeon or her tissues are not normal. (laughs) So don't have anything big on that. Yes. But her tissues are not normal. And I'm like, oh no kidding. <laughs> wow. That's a lot. And can you tell just, cause I think it's a, what kind of work do you do? Yes. I am an academic librarian and I work at a university primarily with first year and anthropology students, which I love it so much. Um, my background was in anthropology. So it's amazing to get to use that again. Um, and even keep applying it back to like my own health. And so what I teach mainly is it's called information literacy. And it's essentially trying to teach students the power behind information. So understanding how it's created, how it's organized, how it's processed, how it's shared, um, and what that means for the information that is there to try to, as we've been doing for the last however long, is battle this misinformation, disinformation, Um, that causes just a lot of struggle within our human society. Yeah. I feel like for all newly diagnosed chronic illness patients, they should be required to take like an information literacy class because it would save people from falling down these rabbit holes of these miracle cures. And yeah, understand what is the difference between a blog, um, someone like a hospital systems page, a government page, website, um, a book that is written by maybe like a pop science kind of one person hobbyist, a book that is a well-researched, well-cited and the kind of information you would find in there and how you would use it. So that is my daily life passion. That's, that's so wonderful. I mean, I, yeah, I would, I was an anthropology minor, so awesome. I just want to talk to you about anthropology, but yeah, but for today we have so, again, I'm just so grateful for you for sharing your story. Cause it's, there's a lot. And I know that something that we both are really passionate about and have unfortunately have in common is the experience of medical gaslighting. Yes. So yes. can you tell us about how this happened to you with respect to your lung nodule, et cetera? <laughs> Yeah. So I want to back up and kind of set the stage for this lung nodule happening. Um, so I have known that I've had this nodule, which is basically just like a, um, kind of like a growth, um, in my lung. It had been there for about a decade. We weren't worried about it. Um, still fighting other symptoms my whole life of just mostly pain, lots of issues with pain. And then some really gnarly, um, I've had a couple of blood clots that were really scary and terrifying with some ICU stays for those, and then, you know, I had been digging and trying to get this diagnosis and I finally decided, never mind, I am just going to manage symptoms and I'm going to live my life. So I spent nine months doing endurance training because I'm a road cyclist. So this means that I was riding my bike for 250 miles a week, um, usually 30 to 80 miles at a time outside on the road. You know, we're, I'm, I'm not very fast, but going you know, around averaging 16 miles an hour or so, which is pretty okay. Doing all of that. And I had been having for well over a decade issues with my right shoulder. It's very loose coming out of the joint. Finally got a surgeon to do surgery on it. We did the surgery. And then two weeks later, everything just like crashed. Um, I had tried to go back to work and all of a sudden I could not move my legs. 
So that's what, remember I said, the hypokalemic periodic paralysis will eventually get that there. Um, cause I was gaslit on that for a year and a half. Um, but when I got to the ER for that, they found this, um, this nodule in my lung had opened up a hole. So what it essentially done is necrotized and destroyed lung tissue in my left lung, a good like two inches by two inches. And it hadn't been there about a year before. So the doctors were all in a panic that this had to come out immediately. You know, they did try to biopsy it. They looked at it. They could not figure out for the life of them what it was. Usually when you have these, it's a walled off, um, it's an old infection or something else, or it could be like hiding a cancer. So they decided best course was to remove it. So I had surgery to take it out where they cut out the nodule and the whole hole so that essentially it can't keep um, growing. And after that surgery, I did not recover. Um, They sent me home and I was struggling to do anything. I was struggling to breathe. I could not fall asleep. If I lay down on my back, I would begin to suffocate. Um, This is a minor trigger warning. If you don't like body fluids, I'll give you some moments to like mute it or turn away, turn it down. Um, My chest cavity was full of fluid that I did end up having taken out about half a liter. Um, Really gross, very uncomfortable. Felt better after that, but I was still not getting better. I reached the six week point. I had been complaining to my surgeon and all my follow-ups. I can't breathe. I am not better. I'm like nearly passing out in a target. How did I go from doing a 90 mile bike ride to suddenly I can't walk half a mile to the grocery store? Like what is wrong? And he just kept insisting that there was nothing wrong. My x-rays were fine. Um, finally, I did go back to the hospital and they admitted me for a full week because my lung had started to collapse a little bit. And I was like, great, I told you, I don't feel well. And oh, this surgeon comes back to me and he just starts to scold me so hard that I started crying by myself in this hospital. I'm hooked up to the walls with like chest tubes coming out of my side. And he is just berating me. He's like, why do you keep coming to the ER? I see that you have anxiety. Is it just anxiety? He's like, there's nothing wrong with you. I have told you over and over you are tall. So I'm five foot nine. And he's like, and you're very thin. I'm 120 pounds. So he's like tall and thin people often have problems with this. Like you just need to keep waiting. I'm just, he was just so angry at me. It felt like he was taking it personally that like I was doing this just to annoy him somehow. And I cried and cried and cried. I tried to get a new surgeon. They wouldn't let me see a new surgeon. I eventually am out of the hospital. He tells me come back in a month. We're now three months post-surgery and I come back and he's like, huh, I I'm surprised you're not better by now. And I was like, I'm not, uh, the fluid is back. I can feel it. You can feel it. You can hear it. And he gives, he tells me again, you are tall. You are thin. He tells me that, um, he's like, if you go see someone else, they might tell you need another surgery, but you don't need that other surgery. Like very heavily implying. I should not talk to, I shouldn't even see another doctor. And he said, come back in three months. We're already three months post-surgery and I, I cannot work. I cannot do anything. So luckily I already had a second opinion scheduled with a doctor within a research hospital system fully outside of there. I saw them and they're like, oh, absolutely not. You're having a surgery. Your lung is still collapsing. So that doctor lied to me because he told me my x-rays were fine. I would get my x-ray path results back, or x-ray radiology results back. And it would say her lung is getting worse every time her lung is getting worse. Oh, and he's no. just insisting that it's not. So I had one day where I won't share all the details, but I knew something had gone wrong. And I drove myself two and a half hours with a heart rate of probably about 140. Um, and to it, to that hospital and was like, Hey, I think my lungs collapsed. And they're like, wow, sure has, we can't find it. So I get, um, like admitted immediately. They get the more chest tubes in, relieve all the pressure. And then they finally, finally, this is my, like the best moment or the worst. Um, they did a CT scan of my chest and the doctor calls me back. I'm still in my hospital room. I'm like, Oh, that's not good. If she's calling me, they've found something. And they said, you have an air leak along your original suture line. 
you're going to have surgery again. We're going to redo the surgery. And I definitely had a night in that hospital where I just like stomped around and just like swore at that surgeon up and down in my head and just had my moment of like, I was right. I was right. So they redo the surgery. Um, I am released within a week. I get to go home and I got better. Um, suddenly I went, I'm not normal, but I went back to much better than I was before. Unfortunately, as we're recording now, it, we are still in the pandemic. I was released in March of 2020 just to go straight into the pandemic. So I have been home inside since then. Can you remind me? I'm sorry. At this point, you did not have a any other diagnoses, just the lung nodule, or did you already have rheumatoid arthritis? No. So this is when we're now moving from the, so I'm getting these pathology reports back to the lung nodule and they're, you can even read in them. They're like, Oh, it's probably an infection. It's probably this, it's probably that. And nope. All they could conclude was it's a rheumatoid nodule. Oh, right. So that sent me back into the rheumatology system. And I've already seen at least two or three rheumatologists. I have done all of the workups everything. I've always had nothing shows up in my blood work, no RA factor. I don't even show like inflammation. And it was really funny to hear all these doctors be like, wow, I think you have an inflammatory disease. And that's what caused your like lung nodule to die and why you get blood clots. I'm like, I know I have been telling you my body is on fire for the last five years. And I think you think I'm just exaggerating. I am not. I just, yeah, my blood is boiling just hearing this story. And And that's not even a one-off. That's, I mean, that is just, that's the worst, but that is just so typical of just everyone. Most doctors I see are just like, there's, there's nothing wrong with you. Well, what, and I think what strikes me is that a lot of the people that, that I talked to that have gone through something like this, I guess, including myself prior to my RA diagnosis, there wasn't anything objective that anyone could see. Yes. And, 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 but in your case, you literally had a giant lung nodule and you also had a history of blood clots. Like these are, these are serious things. Yeah. Like you had a surgery in your shoulder. I mean, you had a medical history and you had something that was requiring surgery yet we're still told well, most people who are tall and thin have a hard time recovering from this surgery and um, you just need to stop being so hysterical. Yeah, basically, basically stop being hysterical. Stop being anxious. He's like, your symptoms, I think, like just heavily implying that my anxiety is what's causing my symptoms. And I'm like, I don't think I'm that powerful. Well, yeah, and did you ever have a chance to talk to that original surgeon? Or That's so I com- filed a complaint with the hospital. Um, they sent me this horrible canned message back saying that since I signed the waiver, basically I signed away my rights and that kind of, sorry, not sorry. Actually, I think I have a letter. Cause I know me, like so. when I, I used to work for university of Washington medical center and they had a whole department called risk management that was supposed to like be yeah. on what's the word. It was not about, um, like punishing medical professionals. It was just for making mistakes. It was about that department specifically was about look investigating medical errors or near misses and cases where people didn't get treated as well as they should have. And then just using those to educate the doctors and everyone else. And then of course, punitive things could be, we're in like a different system, but like, this feels like a classic case where like it should have been you. Yeah, no, it's so funny. I actually have the letter sitting here still because I just, it's been a year and I don't know how to fight this anymore. It says our review found that prior to surgery, your physician explained the potential risks and complications of surgery. Your written informed consent was also obtained prior to surgery. We're sorry to hear you're having ongoing issues. And it said our review was unable to identify any deviations from the standard of care and the potential complications were reviewed with you prior to surgery. Basically being like, we told you that we might screw up. It was well, never yeah, acknowledged. That's, I mean, but that doesn't cover them, him from accusing you of faking, yes. telling you you don't need another surgery. I mean, if you had, it would be interesting to see from the the cert, the good surgeon's um, uh, opinion, if you hadn't driven yourself to the ER, would you have died? Probably. Um, yeah. yeah. So a collapse. So what would they lung. say? You signed something. So we don't give a crap. Sorry, like, no, sorry. Yeah. they wouldn't want to use that normally. I think, I mean, you, you're supposed to use those as like, learn. I mean, again, I'm having this at the end of every conversation I have, it's like, <laughs> if I rule the world, but. Oh yes. 
I mean, maybe that was just because I worked at a teaching hospital, but that was a big focus at University of Washington, at least was like, okay, like we, we need to investigate and learn from these errors and, and near misses. So anyway, yeah. I'm so this sorry. A refusal. And not, you shouldn't have to even, do the work. Yeah. Sorry. No. And he didn't even order a CT scan. I mean, he never had, I never had a CT scan post-surgery to even, he couldn't even comprehend that maybe something had gone wrong. He was just relying on x-rays and x-rays will not show, um, this air tracking that I was having and just, and yeah, so I ended up also sending detailed letters both to him and to his office manager at his practice and never heard back. So it's kind of like, you know, what do I do next? I don't want this guy to get away with it. Um, yeah. Well, okay. I have some ideas, but for the purpose of this, yeah. for the podcast, That's like a whole it's, other, yeah. <laughs> because the thing is that like, there are going to be cases like, okay, like, and this is me having, I used to work as the orientation um, facilitator for the university of Washington. Oh so I wasn't goodness. in a clinical role, but so every, every other week I got to hear the risk management. This is why this is so ingrained in my brain. And again, maybe it's just what they said at orientation might not have been what they actually did, but um, they had this little um, video they showed everyone. It was called to air is human. And like, so it used to be that like, okay, if there was a medical error made, like you just fire that doctor and it's seen as like one bad apple, but like in the data shows, right. That it's a, almost always like a systems problem. Like there's yeah. something in the system. Like for example, you know, the system for surgery, like the classic case is somebody operates on the wrong leg. Well, now it's like, they have checklists where they always like right. double check, triple check, you sign it, you know, <laughs> yeah, they sign the so, shoulder. Like the medical gaslighting is so hard because again, to air is human. And at times the doctors are taught, like when you hear hoofbeats, think zebras or thinks right. horses, not yes, zebras. Yes, yes. So in your case, oh, you're tall, you're young, you're, you're tall and skinny, you're young, you're a woman, you must be anxious and, and hysterical. Yeah. Again, that's an explanation, not an excuse, but like, so how do how can the medical system, like obviously in the case of a doctor yelling at you and accusing you of like, Ne- telling you never to come back to the ER because you're just being hysterical. Like that is so egregiously wrong. Like there's, and, but there's also, I mean, I'm sure many times of these more subtle, you know, subtle gaslighting that you've had. Like, do you, are you sure? Is this really that bad? Yeah. Well, I don't know. Have you, have you had that experience too? Oh yeah. Just Usually curious. because I am the worst patient of all my main um, complaints has been pain and no oh. one likes to talk to someone with pain because pain is nothing. And yet everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. Well, we don't have good treat. We don't have great treatments for pain. You know, we don't, the and there's no way to see it. And you're stuck relying on the patient to tell you, and then you have to believe the patients. Um, so, and yeah, I have, if we get to that two more, I had some more to say yeah. about pain in our later. So just to tie the loop on the diagnosis. So you, yeah. they looked at the nodule and determined it was a rheumatoid nodule, which yes. can happen for, with rheumatoid arthritis, yeah. but you don't have any other symptoms. Is your overall pain like in the pattern of rheumatoid arthritis or no? It's kind of yes and no. So I have pain in like my arms and my legs and more recently in my hands and it's between the joints. So it's not like the joint I'm pointing as if you can see me, like the joints themselves do not swell, but in between the joints, they just ache. And so I have a lot Mm. of just aching and, um, I will joke with my mom. She's in her late sixties that like, I'll wake up in the morning and just like, Oh my God, just like, Mm -hmm. and she's just, I was like, do you have pain when you wake up? And she's like, no, Yeah. Oh, you don't wake up just kind of like, ah, how did I get here? So it's not Mm -hmm. obvious and you can't see it. But morning, having worse symptoms in the morning is a typical pattern for rheumatoid, but you're definitely, you're a hundred percent right. That usually it's inside the joint capsule. It's not in between, but that could be, maybe it's that you have that unusual connective tissue. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Maybe maybe that's part of it. Yeah. Yeah. And what, pushed me farther into RA was that, um, my rheumatologist is a fantastic doctor that I have, Mm -hmm. um, here in Charlotte. And he agreed to let me start trying different RA medications to see what worked. I went on Mm -hmm. Plaquenil first, did nothing. Methotrexate did nothing. I think methotrexate made me feel worse, but he gave me a steroid taper and I was like, 
I feel like my body is no longer on fire. I was like, it has cooled off and relaxed. And he was like, Oh, <laughs> like, well, that's, that's pretty strong towards that. So, um, went ahead and just was like, you know, this is as close as we can get with a sero negative rheumatoid arthritis. And then I have started on the biologics recently. And those have also done wonders for my pain, but have made the paralysis disease that I mentioned earlier way worse. So we're oh. still in medication trials and probably will be for maybe another year or two, but I at least kind of feel like we have a direction rather than just spinning my wheels. Yeah. And when did the paralysis start? The hy- hypokalemic? Yes. Period. Hypokalemic Sorry, periodic Kalemic. paralysis just okay. means yes. low potassium. That is what sent me to the ER almost two years ago where they found the hole in my lung. So this is another great example of, I don't know if you would call this medical gaslighting, but it's at least being dismissed. So they could not find any cause for that and went ahead and diagnosed me with conversion disorder, which is literally the modern day term for hysteria. Um, you can Google that. Um, I was very angry in that hospital because I had three psych evaluations and this is not to speak poorly on psych. I, I have a psychiatrist. I have seen a psychiatrist for years. I understand my own more than mental health. I know what I've got going on that is diagnosed Mm -hmm, and that mm -hmm. has been stable. This is not it. Uh, I was like, I have never paralyzed myself in an extreme situation. They just kept asking like, are you stressed? Are you traumatized? And I had been through some really traumatic things recently with work. And I was like, no, nothing happened then. And this is about as worse as you can get at something to happen, um, at a school, Mm -hmm. uh, with weapons. And I had been through it and no, did not collapse. Then I was like, this is not mental. And I kept having more episodes after I left the hospital, but the lung got priority. Um, I went to the ER a few times. They couldn't figure it out. I even had one coming out of surgery. I had a paralysis attack. And I, so I had a neurologist at that research hospital see me have it and still go, yeah, that's conversion disorder. So I just dropped it. No one wanted to do anything about it. Um, but what I did instead is I kept a spreadsheet of every single attack that I had um, with the time, how long it lasted. I put down what was I thinking about before it happened, which was usually just nonsense and any other details, like whatever I did that day that I could come up with. And then, so last January, which would be a year and a half for my first attack, I gave it back to a neurologist and he was like, oh, finally figured it out. And now I see a specialist um, who specializes in this disease. And yeah, I'm pretty classic. And you said it was genetic? Yes. I don't have a known gene, but they have identified about 70% of the genes I think that go with this or 70% of people who have this disease have a gene. So there's still quite a few of us who don't have it, but to show the rarity, this disease only affects less than 5,000 people in the entire United States. Yeah. And that's, yeah. Well, I mean, I think just the experience of being told, cause I, I was told I was just anxious. I was dismissed many times, said yes. that you're not sick, you're hypochondriac, but I was never formally diagnosed with conversion disorder. Oh. And that would have been so traumatic for me because, and again, conversion disorder, um, you know, is, I'm sure there are some people who legitimately have it, but to be inaccurately diagnosed with it, to me, it means that it slams the door on them pursuing other alternate explanations. Yeah. And I was still having paralysis attacks. Um, and at that point when I would become paralyzed, I literally cannot move. So I would not be able to move my legs at all. It would last for about two hours or so, then it'd wear off. Does but it, it meant, affect other muscles like your trunk or yes, your face? It can go for the full body. Um, I had my first one there. I did go to the ER for that one because my entire body froze. I couldn't move anything. I had lifted up food on my fork to put to my mouth and just froze everything. I could not even speak. I was so paralyzed. Um, but it usually stays away from your ability to breathe, blink, like in your internal systems will still work for some people. It doesn't. Um, but in general, you're just frozen because what what potassium does is it helps you contract your muscles. Mm -hmm. So all these tiny, so it's, 
as you're listening to this, think about all the little movements you're doing. Like you move your hands, move your head, um, anything to do. You're not even thinking about the fact that you're doing that without potassium. You can't, it just, there's no response. You say move and there's just no communication and it's pretty terrifying. I'm yeah, that's what one of my phobias, like my clytrophobia is fear of being trapped. And so yes. that sounds exactly like, yes, I'd have many meltdowns. I'm because, so sorry. Yeah. Well, and that actually leads, so I'm going to switch the order of question. Yeah, three and, but yeah, that leads me to the mental health aspect of, of yeah. all of this. I mean, just going through one of these experiences alone would have been hard enough, but all the aggregate things you've been through, how, what are some ways that, or how has it affected you mentally and what has helped you cope? Yeah, definitely. So I'll go with coping first, start on a positive note, medication. Medication is truly the only thing that is keeping me functioning. Um, I'm on a few different SSRIs, um, some other mood stabilizers. And what they do for me is I call it my brain shield. It is like a mental shield where all of those really um, your anxious thoughts, your spiraling, if you have ever spiraled with anxiety where you just feel like you just cannot focus, it doesn't necessarily have to be a panic attack, but where just you are just frantic and nothing's going to calm you down. Um, it prevents my brain from going too far past that to where I would become incapacitated. So that absolutely. And then I have seen a therapist. Luckily I saw her before all of this happened. So she is now just part of my just chronic illness, just someone I can talk to about with new symptoms, new diagnoses, frustrations with doctors, someone who can help uh, validate your feelings is wonderful. That's so good. So good. Yes. Um, and then on the downside, this is also too, because I have struggled with really extreme pain since I was seven. And at the time of this recording, I'm 33. So it has been my entire awareness existence has been pain. Um, we thought they were migraines when I was younger, but at a pain level of where you're, a child is screaming in bed, throwing up, crying, nothing can make them feel better. I mean, just the pain is excruciating. And I have kept a journal since I was little and um, since I was 13 and to the point where I would just write down, like had a headache today and then just go off at whatever else I did that today. Like it, that is just how normal it is. Um, it averages out to about 15 days a month, which is just 50% of the time since I was seven, this is just my normal. Oh. So I've already got that going on. So when you start piling in, um, I had a, um, it's called it colloquially a saddlebag pulmonary embolism. Um, it means that you had a blood clot go to your lungs and block both major bronchial whatever's in your lungs. Like your lungs are fully blocked. You Whoa. should be dead. Um, I survived that when I was 23. Um, I found another clot caught at this time in my leg when I was 26 or seven. And then to go that to suddenly now I'm having this paralysis and a hole in my lung. It is just a build up of, I've never get a break. I never get a break yeah. from illness. It is just a constant battle with this body of either just pain or sudden life-threatening um, chaos. Yeah. So something that I want to talk about here, and I want to give big trigger warnings for people because I want to talk about the really dark sides of mental health and what your brain can kind of do to you when this happens. And I do have um, diagnosed generalized anxiety disorder. I just got a lot of anxiety. I mm -hmm. blame my genetics on that one also. Um, yeah. But I want to talk about, and I'm not even sure I had it even better of how to bring this up, but I want to give a trigger warning for discussion of suicide. And I want to give everyone who's listening plenty of time as I'm saying this, if you feel like you need to, again, you want to turn that dial down, mute your uh, listening device. If you're running across the room, trying to get back to wherever your control is to turn it down, hopefully you'd have enough time now. But the reason I want to talk about um, suicide and suicidal ideation is that if there's anyone else who is listening to this, who is struggling with this, I want them to hear my experience with it. So they don't feel alone because I have felt so alone with this because you cannot just go up to some, you know, you can't just tell someone that you're like, I'm feeling suicidal. They'll panic and wonder, you know, do I take you to a hospital? And you're like, no, it's not that bad. And they're like, what? And I did not learn until 
probably in the last couple of years that this idea of suicidal ideation exists because I've had these thoughts literally since I was seven, when you're lying in bed within so much pain, you just want it to end. Um, so with this discussion of suicide, I also want to put in a very strong disclaimer about disability and suicide. And I know that there is a long and horrible history of really horrible times in human experience where the disabled have been killed for being disabled or sick or ill or um, viewing people who are ill or disabled as having less value. So this is not a value discussion of human life. This is talking about suffering. But I also, since we have both have an anthropology background, something that anthropologists do look for in human evolution and society development is actually healing in humans. So if they found a body where a bone has healed, or they have found like stretchers that are used to carry like maybe the old or the people who are unable to walk, that that is a huge sign that um, cooperativeness and group um, societies are forming and we're doing better together because for a bone to heal, it means that that person had to have been allowed to rest for at least six weeks for that bone to heal and the others are taking care of them. So there is good. People do help. Um, I just wanted to lay that out there as well. So with this discuss um, this discussion of suicide and being ill, um, for me, it is a way out it feels like I have some sense of control and that if, you know, it comes to the end all be all where I am just in so much pain. And that's what I'm getting at for this suicidal feelings is that it's around suffering. It's not thinking like I'm worthless. It's not thinking that I am just, I mean, there is some of that, you know, sometimes I do feel like a huge burden on everyone who has to take care of me. Um, but more just to end suffering so I also want to talk about with um, suicide prevention and harm reduction that healthcare, access to healthcare is harm reduction. Free access to healthcare is harm reduction. Even with my um, health insurance, I still pay six to eight thousand dollars a year and have for the last seven years on healthcare. And I can afford that. And I know I'm very privileged for that. And I'm terrified of the day that I may not be. So in addition to that, having free, safe, clean housing, access to food, jobs, um, physical support, either that be like, you know, devices or technology, accommodations at work, public government programs, relationships. These are all suicide prevention and harm reduction. And I think these are just all so important to talk about that, you know, I did have moments where I locked myself in the bathroom and just decided I had just had it. I was not, did not, you know, want to kill myself that night, but I just felt like I had no more options. I had nowhere else to go. No one was believing my pain and my symptoms. And I was just tired and I had just had it. So anyone listening, if you have felt that, please know you are not alone. There is nothing wrong with you. This is a very normal thought process to have. Um, you know, we know all the places online, but for me, what has helped is having a therapist and finding the people who get it. And even that is part of a barrier to even find the people. So loneliness too. Yeah, no. And I'm so grateful for you to, again, that you're willing to speak to this because like you said, there is such a lack of awareness around it or, um, this idea that people who feel suicidal ideation, it's because like you, you, you said it per perfectly more better than I could, but that they feel that they're worthless or feel that their life doesn't have meaning. But I feel like when I think about it in terms of chronic pain, it's their chronic illness. It's almost like you want to have a, full, you want to live, yeah. you want to have a full, I mean, you, I could tell by, you know, just knowing you, you have a vibrant personality of so much to give to the world, but you have this giant weight on you. That's just preventing you from like, from being able to have a pain-free existence. And that's, that's a lot to yes. deal with. <laughs> and you feel like you have to hide it too. Um, it's been really mm -hmm. shocking within this last year that um, I've had, so I am out mostly at work with my um, illnesses. It just helps people understand me. Also, if I'm going to be paralyzed at work, 
people might as well know what's happening. So they don't yeah. panic also. Um, but I have had so many people, even doctors be like, you're taking this so well, how are you handling this so well? And I'm like, this is a trauma response because you, no one wants to actually see how poorly I handle this sometimes. And since I live alone, no one sees me crying at night, reads my journal entries that are very, they're heavy. You know, I'm talking about how I just don't want to be alive anymore. I don't want to keep going like this, that I've had all of the things that I used to love doing taken away with me that just this body has failed. And I think we need to have more open discussions to first around this need to hide these feelings and to be more uncomfortable, be more comfortable with being uncomfortable um, because it also was like, well, she's taking it so well. Why can't you? Because no one sees your darkest hours except for maybe a few close friends. And then second is to kind of see bodies again as not these moral value things, but as a tool. And sometimes they fail. And sometimes the body just does not work how everyone else's does or how you want it to. And that's where we need to have room for discussions of bigger things to do, like better pain management, better support, better reduction in suffering. And that accepting that I don't think people should have to live in a body that causes them so much pain. Um, and I'm hoping that we, as, as a, I doubt it in this country, but can get more open discussions of like the right to die and just that allow people to see a to not see death as a failure of like a moral failure or a value failure, or, you know, we have so many different belief systems. Um, but sometimes death is a way to end suffering and we should be able to talk about it more. Yeah. I, I know there's been more awareness of, um, you know, deaths by suicide that are related to like forced weaning off of opiates, you know, in the chronic pain community due to the yes. opioid crisis, which yes. doesn't actually the opioid crisis for the record does not have hardly anything to do with chronic pain patients. Correct. They are not the abusers. Um, and again, anyone who abuses drugs also deserves, you know, compassion. They are, and yes. And they need a different set of management that speaks to, because, because they're, they're also trying to usually reduce some sort of pain Yeah, that we don't know what it is, um, whether that's just, they don't like, you know, a bad life situation, poverty, trauma, abuse. There's so much humans are hiding. We're all hiding so much. Then we get into problems where we need help and that we need to help everyone and understand how to help everyone, but we can't, if we're treating everyone, like again, criminal criminals, bad, yeah. these value judgments on people has just got to drop. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And you know, when you, when you have talked to your therapist about, about this, has there been anything that they've said that's been helpful or is it more just. It's mostly like, validating. Um, she just mm -hmm. really helps ground me and helps me just be like, yes, of course you feel that way. Like I would too. You absolutely should. Um, and I think that's, that's most important for me because what I need is to feel validated. I need to feel that, you know, my feelings are real and that, you know, most people would feel this way. Cause I often feel like I'm just overreacting to everything because I have lived in a traumatizing body my entire life. I can't even see what a life is like without that. No, I mean, and it just relates so perfectly to what you're talking about earlier with, you know, medical De gaslighting by definition is a lack of validation. It's saying yes. you're not, you're not sick. You're not, your pain is not real. Yes. It's not that bad. It can't yeah. be that bad. And then it leads, it can lead you, doesn't always, but it can lead you to gaslight yourself. Like, yes. I mean, and, and we, I honestly think like some, some of my friends with, you know, chronic illnesses are some of like the most mentally strong people I know in terms of having coped with so much pain and suffering. And yet we're the ones that actually question ourselves right. and say, like, right. is it really that bad? Or like, or I'll have people comment things to me, this totally different issue, but like, you know, I'll be like dancing in a video and they're like, well, your RA must be like really mild if you're dancing. I'm like, well, you don't know how much pain I'm in when I'm dancing. Like, obviously I'm right. not at a 10 on 10. Like I am, I'm not, I'm, I, it but I am. It fluctuates. Yeah. It fluctuates. And I'm pers in like, dancing is like a way to help like move my body. Move but anyway, yeah. but you know, but we, we guess that gaslight ourselves. And we, at the end of the day, we don't really know what someone else's pain feels like. We right. don't, you know, um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, in, in my emotional and, and mental health past, 
I have struggled with that fear of being trapped. And I have had that fear or that feeling of when I'm trapped in my body, when I have a lot of pain and discomfort in my body, um, I've never conceptualized it as like suicidal ideation in, in my case, but just to share a little bit mm-hmm. to, to further the you know conversation about this, it's the feeling of, I have to get out. Like, I have to get I, out. And Let there's a knowledge out. in my head that like, like there are ways to get like that, you know, I, I'm not like, I'm at the point where it's just like, something has to change. Like something's got to give, I can't handle any more of this. Like that was where I was at, um, a few years ago when I had a whole bunch of stomach issues going on oh, on yeah. top of, yeah, where oh, I just my. couldn't digest. I was wasting away. Yeah. And I just was like, I have to get out of this body. I kept having this vision of like, a head transplant, like just moving <laughs> yes. my brain onto someone else's yes. body. And like, you know, it's a horrible feeling to feel trapped in your, in your body. I mean, that's cause you can't, it's the thing you can't get out of. Like, right. Right. I can't leave. Like this is yeah. me everywhere I go. There it is. Like, is that's that, did you so have any perfect. of the same? Yeah. Yes, okay. So much. I made a, a note of that. Yes. Cause that's where a lot of where I just like, I can't escape and knowing that there are people out there most people don't know what that's like. Most people, especially young, do not know what it's like to be in a body that has tried to kill you a few times Mm -hmm. or that is just causes you so much pain and suffering. And they can't even conceptualize what that is like. And what I try to do when I try to advocate for myself and do like educational things is that becoming disabled, becoming ill is the one thing that can happen to any of us at any time. You know, in general, we're not going to wake up looking really different. Our ethnicity is probably not going to change overnight. You know, we're probably not going to change into a different, um, other community that we weren't born into. You know, it's hard to say that clearly, but anyone can become sick and disabled at any moment at any time. So when they see it happening to someone, they are just reminded that this can happen to them. So something that I hear a lot that I try to push back against, and even some of my um, people close to me will say this. I'll just like, well, I, you know, I eat really healthy. I'm really healthy. I've never been sick. I do. I exercise. I do X, Y, Z. And I just want to tell people that matters, but it also is not going to stop your body from doing things because mm-hmm. what you end up saying is you're implying that sick people didn't do all of that. And that it's their fault for getting ill when it's, I, right now, it just seems like your genetics are just going to do whatever they want, whatever they feel like it. And also you just don't know, you do not know what you are carrying and you might be carrying horrible things that never turn on. You might be carrying things that just randomly. We just all want that sense of control. It's a comforting thought. And that's like my therapist, the most helpful thing that my therapists have done. Cause I have a, I have a psychologist and a psychiatrist that have both done full hour sessions of therapy, not like, so, cause some psychiatrists do therapy and some right. solely do medication management, but, um, and they've really helped me like really acknowledge and accept that, like accepting meaning, like, you know, um, in, in the book that I read about all this, the happiness trap, it's like taking what is offered, like, doesn't mean that you're happy about it. It just means like, this is it, like, this is reality right. and connecting yeah. to that and being like, the reality is like, I did quote unquote, everything right with my health, right? Like I was active. I ate well, I exercised, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I still got this. And like, it doesn't, there's no necessarily deep meaning in it. Like like, the more you try to find the meaning, it's just an illusion. It's just like, life is random. Like babies get lung cancer and they haven't smoked or anything. It just happens. Like, so, but people don't want to, it's an uncomfortable, it's an inconvenient truth. Yes. Yes. No one wants to consider their own mortality and we scare them because we're just daily reminders that it can happen to you. Like for me, for being very thin. So I also know that I wasn't even going to go into this, but like, I have like thin privilege that I have talked Mm -hmm. to a lot of um, chronically ill friends who are not thin and whose doctors are like, well, I just think it's, it's just your weight. So So I think doctors look at me and I think I actually anger them by being very thin because they can't blame it on that. So it screws up their whole perspective that like, I have as much pain as I'm sure people who carry more weight than I do come in. And it's like, what's my excuse? Maybe I actually just hurt. Yeah. Maybe there, and that's, yeah, maybe there are, there are, there is a limit and this is what no one wants to think about their own limits, right? No profession wants to, but like, I think, like, I think all medical providers at the end of the day, if they're really being honest with themselves, like acknowledge that there is a limit, right? We can't right now, like medical science 
isn't evolved enough to be able to make like every person who's had a spinal cord yeah. injury walk again or like they know that like they and like even like rheumatology and I will say for the record rheumatologists as a whole I think are some of the most patient centered and least Agreed. like least likely to gaslight of like any yes. profession that yes. maybe second to like pediatrics but um <laughs> pediatrics can sometimes just because they get so many parents that are like objectively overly worried, you know, oh, sure. that, but then they also get parents that are legitimately worried and then they get dismissed as being, you know, hypochondriac parents. But anyway, but like, you know, they like, I think rheumatologists because of the, how ambiguous, like the profession is in terms of like, well, it could be lupus. It could not like, there's so right. many great so systemic. areas. They have to acknowledge that. Like, we don't know for sure. And like, it's interesting. Like, I'm not sure if you've ever had this before, but I think one of the best things a doctor told me once was like, um, it was an ophthalmologist. I have really chronic dry eyes. I was never diagnosed oh, with Sjogren's yeah. who knows. I maybe saying, I yeah. have it. <laughs> I might have Sjogren's. I don't know. Maybe it's in my chart somewhere, but, um, you know, all I just know is I have dry eyes and, it's, and they, they felt, I know it was explained to me as it's related to your rheumatoid arthritis. Hmm. And at one point I got to the ophthalmologist, we had tried different things. And he goes like, this is it. Like this, we're at the end of what I can do for you. Yeah. Like these, we've reached the limit. Like, and he, it wasn't like in a, it wasn't like a go away little girl, I don't care about yes. you. It was just like, I know that your eyes are still drier than you would like. And like, these are the things I can provide for that I've provided. Like I provided these eye drops and like done these like tear duct plugs. He's like, and I just like, there. Yeah, I just I've done need, the plugs. I need to yeah. tell you, there's like nothing more that I can do. And most likely any other provider. And like, this might be something you have to live with. And like, it's interesting because I've seen on social media, some patients get really upset when doctors say that. And like every, right. first of all, everyone is like totally totally should have, you know, ownership and empowerment to like accept and embrace their own feelings about any situation. So I'm not saying because yes. I felt this way, you should. Yes. Yeah, yes I yes. felt like this person is being honest with me and they're saving me time and money, right? Because if they, if they just said, well, come back again in three months, maybe something else I can do. For oh them. yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like they were in the, I know in the chronic pain community, this has happened too, where like, um, I have a, a friend who lives with, with chronic pain from fibromyalgia. She's an occupational therapist. She was in episode, uh, three, I think it was. Um, and she, she's a pain scientist. She's a, master's in occupational therapy, PhD in psychology, studying pain. And she's like, so many patients, like no one ever just tells them like, we might not be able to make your pain go away. Like, and that's really like, and we can say like, we can always hope for more better treatments, like hope, like we're not going to like give up. Right. That doesn't mean like yes. all researchers, because there's no cure for pain right now, all researchers are just going to be like, okay, pack up, Never go mind. home. Yeah. But like for today and tomorrow and the next day, like in this current existence where like, we don't have a cure for your pain, what can we do to maximize, like in the OT lingo, it would be like maximize your ability to participate in your life, have a meaningful existence and cope and persevere with this pain. And instead of like, and it's like a relief to some patients to hear that because they're still, they've been reinforced by this system. That's like, oh, you just need to go to the next person. Oh, you need to go to the chiropractor. You need to try the supplement. You need to try the diet. You need, yes, I don't know. Acupuncture, the, yeah. I joked that the only thing I have not tried still is an exorcism. <laughs> Oh, like, yeah. That's the one thing I think I have not tried. Cause yeah, you get the, have you tried? And I'm like, you don't even want to hear my list that like, whatever you're going to suggest, I'm 10, you know, I'm three decades past that. Well, and I think in your case, particularly when you have comorbidities, like, you know, the first thing when people talk to me about diet stuff, I'll be like, well, I have a history of gastroparesis and that automatically limits because, and a history of severe SIBO, which is like small intestine bacteria overgrowth. And so, yeah, as nice as like a vegan diet sounds great. If RA was my only issue, I would probably try yeah. that, but I can't, I can't digest a lot of insoluble fiber very well. And that's only just two comorbidities, right? In your right. case. Yeah. You have like severe comorbidities, meaning like different conditions and histories. It's like, it's not just people just, again, everyone wants to think that it's simple. I'm sorry. I'm talking too much. I know, but, and then they know. think that they would do it right. They want to yeah. think that if this happened to them, they're like, well, I would eat vegan. So either a, this would never happen to me. And this is not a, a discussion on vegans. We're just no, like no. picking one group that eats differently. I'm like jealous. Um, of, like, I want to be a vegan. I just can't. <laughs> so I know. Annoying. Um, anyway, sorry. Yeah. But either, you know, I would make better or like either I'm already making the good choices. This will not happen. Or I would make better choices. So I would not suffer as much as you do. It's your fault. And yeah. yeah. So with food, I always push like food has no moral value. Food, like yeah. it has no moral value. You need to eat to sustain your body. 
Yes. Because for my paralysis disease, they try to tell me I need to eat a specific diet. And I have had to tell them, I absolutely cannot do that. I get some disordered eating because I have been obsessive over eating clean because I was not getting any relief anywhere. So I fully bought into for a year of the, like eating no processed food, cooking every single thing from scratch, only meats, fruits, vegetables, and I did not get better. <laughs> no, so that is such an important I story to obsess. tell. Yeah. yeah. So I'm like, no, I will not obsess over food. My only goal with food is to eat. No. And you're actually the, so this is episode 41 of the podcast. You're the fourth person who's brought this up. So, and so I'm saying that not yeah. in terms of like, you're not a unique snowflake, but I'm saying in terms of for other people that this is a common thing to become obsessive when you, when you have so much out of your control with your health that you then you find food is one thing you can control. It's one of the most primal things. Like from when you're a baby, you can choose to latch onto the breast or you can kind of move your neck unless, well, I guess thinking right, about of course, of newborns course. and everyone's like, just shove the breast into their mouth or shove the bottle. In. Anyway, but you know, in general, like it's one of the few things that you control truly like control yes, what you can put yes. in. If you have the privilege of being able to like digest and everything like that, you're not tube fed or anything. So, um, like, uh, the, the, everyone just, yeah, again, a lot of people make it seem so simple. Oh, just try the, try the specific carbohydrate diet, try the no, keto diet, or try whatever this, the current try fad. That. Yeah. Yeah. And again, it, 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 it's all about workability when it comes to like acceptance yes. and commitment therapy, which is how I like live my life. It's like, if something works for you, it works, right? Yes. Like, so if vegan works for you, that's awesome. If the paleo diet works for you, that's awesome. Do whatever works, but don't tell me that what worked for you is a hundred is yes. percent going to work for Absolutely. me because that is not, it's kind of like finding a, a, I guess, like a dating partner or something. There's people who are like, Oh, I'll just right. go to the bar. That's why I found someone. Oh, go on match.com. Go on this. It's like, it's like, this is honestly, okay. I'm sorry. We're just, we're like, we're going on rants now, but this no, is, I love of, it. That's the goal of this podcast. No, but I'll say like about the diet thing. I mean, again, it's important to look at data. There is a lot of research, particularly for the Mediterranean diet, just for the record for if you're, if your only issue is rheumatoid arthritis, you know, whole food, plant-based, um, Mediterranean style diet is great. Um, and I'm a lot of people fish. <laughs> fun for you. Yes, oh. I can't do that. But, but I'm also like, let's say somebody tries this diet and they go into remission and they start selling classes and selling, you know, ways. Uh, yes. I'll say, would you take, would you take a class from somebody who won the lottery on how to win the lottery? They'll be like, these are the three steps I took to win the lottery. I went to the gas station. I yes. bought a ticket. <laughs> I randomly guessed numbers and I won the lottery. It's like, just because someone did these steps and they that something happened to them doesn't mean that those steps are what caused it to happen, right? It's correlation yes. versus causation. So, you know, I, I mean, no one, again, no one wants to acknowledge the role of luck, you know? Yes. Yes. Role- it just happens dance. I have a really another great metaphor that I just thought of from what you were just saying that um, something that I wanted to work into this was um, a discussion of equity. Um, and this, I'm going to tie this back into a really good metaphor, basically that, you know, what works for one person is not going to work for everyone. And I learned this in a, um, a discussion group I've been having at work all over summer talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that it seems like as a country, we're really starting to understand diversity and inclusion, but equity, we're just not getting to. So Equity versus equality. So no, equality is that everyone has the same opportunities at all times. Great. Equity is basically understand that people are not always starting at the same point. That, you know, there are things like that, you know, you know, the money you have growing up, a healthy body, a um just different barriers, amount of trauma you might have experienced, trauma you've never experienced. These are all things that change where you start and where you come from. And that equity is supposed to get anyone who maybe had to start behind where others did back up to that point. It's not equality. It is getting everyone to an even field. And the best metaphor I'd ever heard from this is that if you were to walk in like into an ER right now and survey every single person that's in there, you would not want to give every single person an aspirin. That is not going to work for everyone. For some people, it might. For some people, that might help reduce a heart attack. It might bring some pain down. But there are people who are horribly uh, allergic to NSAIDs. Um, Who that might cause a really severe reaction. There's people like me who are on blood thinners and are not supposed to take NSAIDs with the risk of causing more internal bleeding. 
And just that this idea that, you know, this one thing that it's good, there's nothing wrong with an aspirin. It's an aspirin. Everyone, it's a joke. Go home and take right, an aspirin, right. but not everyone can take an aspirin. We cannot treat everyone the same. And it's easier to do that, right? It's easier to just say everyone gets an aspirin and everyone's right. going to be better because it's a lot harder. It takes a lot more thinking to have to look at everyone individually and understand them. And I try to remind myself of that when I'm seeing medical professionals and trying to talk to them that they are doing a lot of work, but it's still scary if, you know, if they're like, we'll take the aspirin. I'm like, well, that might harm me. And then yeah. they just kind of shrug their shoulders and go, well, that's the only option you have that's that we really need more, cool. more things to bring people up to equitability. You know, that's why like the American with disability act exists for all of these things. And that all of this again, ties back to harm reduction, and suicide prevention is giving people equitable everything. Yeah. It's like really like, I love the phrase of like going upstream, you know, like instead of like, if you see a bunch of like little, let's think about cute furry little animals that are like drowning in this, in the water, all of a sudden, like you can like sit there and rescue them one by one and like take them out of the water. But like, eventually you want to like go upstream and say, what's causing this? Yes. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. So yeah, that, uh, this is all so I'm, I'm hoping that everyone listening is just like finding this as interesting as I am. <laughs> yes. Yes. Or go look up equity. And I think you'll really see where maybe some of your own, like kind of bad feelings about the world and your treatment are. I think it's really in because equity is hard because equity also has to admit that people have more difficult backgrounds than you do. And you are forced to look at your own privileges yeah. And that makes people really uncomfortable and feel really awkward. And we've seen it with, you know, sociopolitical politics in this country and everywhere forever and probably will forever. But we're always trying to get a little bit better that, you know, I still too, yeah. if you can at least help one person that is still doing a lot because you hear a lot, you know, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Well, the few still need help too. And I hope we can really figure out how to do both of those. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I know that something that I think a lot of people are curious about when they have like a new diagnosis, is like, what does a day in the life look like for someone with my same condition? Now, I don't know how many of the 5,000 people that have (laughs) hypokalemic periodic paralysis and RA and connective tissue abnormalities, but you know, um, in general, like what are, you know, what are some of the ways that it impacts your daily life? I mean, you mentioned you're able to work, but have you had any accommodations or modifications and then um, how have you been able to do some of the, the things that you still love to do that bring your life joy, like fostering kittens and stuff like yes. that? Yes. So I'll start off first with the daily life. It's actually one of your TikToks is exactly it. You have a TikTok of where you're laying out all of the things you have oh, that yeah. try to make your day better. That has basically been my life. I didn't even realize how much I have done, but basically I have comfort items everywhere. So I heating pads are one of the best things for me. I actually have two of them stuck to my shoulders right now that they're okay. always there helps my headaches, um, and shoulder, neck, upper back pain. And I, you know, soft blankets, if, um, packs of painkillers, anything that's going to make my body just a little bit more comfortable. I carry that around with me and I carry with me at all times. So basically if you need anything from the pharmacy, I've got it. (laughs) Wow. So you have a little backpack or like, yes. So now I have a full little backpack that also supports the paralysis because I have to carry water, a water bottle, um, fizzy potassium. It dissolves in water to drink during a paralysis attack and something to make it not taste. Oh, so horrible. It's like little propel packets. Um, something to flavor the water with, because sometimes they come on really fast, like 10 seconds. And I've got to get that kit put together and in my mouth before I freeze or just drop to the ground. I try to laugh because it's so preposterous, but I'll just, (laughs) I'll be walking and then just down I go and I can't pick up a leg until it. um, Well, and I'll, I'll tell you like, again, because I, I am so aware of like this, the stupid things or sorry, the unhelpful things not to say to someone, yes. but oh. I'm tell, I'll have to tell you that like the cognitive dissonance, I'm feeling it right now. I'm thinking in my head as you're talking, there has to be something. There has I to know. be something like, have they tried everything? But I'm like, oh my God, this whole art interview is about this. Like they have right? like, we're like compulsive helpers. I know, but I'm like, 
can they just inject it? Can you just like inject potassium at all times? That's like, more but- dangerous because too much potassium can stop your heart. So oh. it actually took me months to even get liquid potassium because they were so afraid I was going to oh. kill myself by taking too much. And I have taken really high doses from it and my body will just reject it. Like it does anything you consume. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, so and I'm, I don't, you don't need to way. explain it. I'm just telling no, I'm you. Happy it's to so... I want people to hear. Oh, good. Okay. I just, I just, I was using it as an example of like, even someone who like spends our time educating other people, like don't give unsolicited advice. Don't, blah, blah, blah. but I'm like, it's so hard not to believe that like, there's a solution. Like right? maybe it's my optimism. You know what I mean? There's like a part of my brain, even though I've been through so much and I know that there's, I literally just said like five minutes ago, like there's not a solution to everyone's pain, but I'm like the five minutes are like, but there has to be (laughs) right. What I've tried to do to work in is if I hear anyone talking about trying to explain symptoms and I'm feeling that compulsion to say, well, have you tried? I have tried to change it to what works best for you. Like, how do you get relief Mm -hmm. to put it back on the person to say like, for me, it is heat. Um, like drinking water is not going to make a difference. You know, they're like, have you had a glass of water? And I'm like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. You know, to yeah. be able to say that like heat, being able to sit down and rest, um, movement helps sometimes, sometimes it makes it worse or just asking for the consideration that like my diseases are very inconsistent. And that's, that's one like of the other hard things. Too. Yes. Like, like, I feel like I'm always like giving people this like inconvenient truth with rheumatoid arthritis. Like I'm going to tell you like what I have in my flare up toolkit, but I will not give you the illusion that if you just have a flare up toolkit, you're always going to be able to prevent a flare up because sometimes flare ups are just random. They just happen. Yep. I, I just got to go home. Yeah. yeah Something so. dropped. Don't know what it was. Don't know yep. how long it's going to last. And that uncertainty yeah. is so hard for people. But so, okay. So you have your backpack that you bring with you yes. of the fizzy yes. potassium and the water bottle and your f- pain management. Okay. Yeah. And the Ooh. daily life too is I'm sure it has been talked about on this podcast a lot. I think it was so life changing for us is that spoon theory. Yeah. And I didn't realize that I have been doing that since I was probably six or seven that I do throughout my oh. entire day. I'm always questioning like, okay, well, if I do this, I can't do that. Or like, okay, well, if I go over to a friend's house and that means I'm probably going to break later and I probably shouldn't do this or that, that I'm always Mm -hmm. making, I even just within my own home recently got rid of all of my glass and ceramic dishes and moved back to plastic. I just kind of went, you know what? I don't think I'm going to die from eating from plastic. It is light. It does not hurt. And if I drop it, I will not hurt myself right now. Plastic is safer. So yeah. trying to right now, trying to find all these little shortcuts. Also, another thing I do is I fake myself. I plan ahead for myself to make mistakes. I oh, know smart. that I'm going to make mistakes. I know that I'm going to go, go somewhere and I'm not going to have my heat pads. I'm going to have forgotten a pain medication. I have squirreled away things everywhere. I keep back full backups in my car, in my office, in my apartment. I live in a pretty tiny apartment. I have a full set of things I need in my bedroom at my workstation and at my couch. So that it's just always Mm -hmm. there. And then there are backups hidden everywhere. So that basically trying to foolproof myself so I can't make a mistake. Yeah. Oh, that's so smart. That's so great. Yeah. I, again, I think a lot of times I think to myself how being an optimist is not helpful for me because like, for example, if I go on vacation and I, I pack my medications, my inclination is to be like, quote unquote, efficient and to be like, well, I'm just going to bring exactly how much medication I need. Oh, yes. But yeah, no, chronic illness has really trained me to be like, nope, bring a full set of extras, everything. You don't know whether you're going to get delayed. You don't know whether you're going to drop yep. your medication box. It's going to get stolen. Like, you know, so you yeah. learn these things. I just got days. fully burned by that. I went on my first vacation. I went home for a week. This is the <gasps> first time I have gone anywhere in almost two years because of the illness and then the pandemic. Yeah. And yeah, everything just went off kilter. Oh. Um, for one, you know, you got to plan for things. You don't know what's going to happen. The fires out West had blown smoke into Illinois and I was struggling to breathe and that was making my paralysis worse. It was making my pain worse. So I blew through like two months worth of stuff in a week that I was like, well, I'm glad I brought it all, but still ran out. And I'm just, sometimes I am grateful for monopolies and being able to call a chain um, pharmacy and just get mm-hmm. it transferred, get it that day. Boy, they're like, why do you keep calling us? Oh. And I was like, nothing went as planned. But again, I brought backups and I hid my backups because I thought I had run out 
of my potassium. And I was like, I'm not going to be able to get home. I don't know what we're going to do because I had brought an entire box, which where I am at my home in North Carolina, I had that was lasting me a week or two and I had blown through it, but I had squirreled away backups into different bags. Like each bag I have has a handful of these potassiums. Right, right. So it's just, I found my whole stash and I just kind of had to put it all together and then I'll go squirrel it back out. So oh my yes, gosh, have oh, backups. So helpful. And what about some of your hobbies or things like rescuing the cat? Yes. Yeah. So, um, a fun thing, I actually started doing this, um, before I got ill, I was volunteering locally at a kitten nursery, which is literally as magical as it sounds. And I volunteered with, um, what they're termed neonatal kittens, which is basically a kitten from day zero hour zero to about four weeks. So these are babies that are fully helpless. They have to be fed on a bottle every two to three hours around the clock. Um, and they need assistance to, assistance to go to the bathroom. They have to be cleaned because they're always, you know, getting dirt messy. So with um, the pandemic, that all closed and they ended up going into our homes. So I started fostering these bitty babies, these two to three week old kittens at home. And that was really helpful because I have had to do this pandemic. Um, again, for anyone listening now, it's summer of 2021. Pandemic's still not over. Um, I have had to do the last year all by myself because I live alone and was was not safe being in public. So having the kittens just, it gave me something to do. It made me feel like I had a purpose again, you know, like they need my help. They don't care what's wrong with me. All they care is that they are warm, they're dry and they're fed. So that was wonderful. I've done about seven rounds. I just turned in kittens like nine and 10 a couple weeks ago. Oh my gosh. So it's wonderful. If you like kittens and feel like you can do this, I highly recommend it. I learned everything I know from kitten lady on YouTube. Oh, okay. Kitten lady. Oh boy. Yes. Hannah Shaw. Again, a long She's rabbit fantastic. Rabbit hole. And I think that's so important to always, to find ways if you can, obviously some people can't, but you know, if you can find yes. a way to still connect to your valued hobbies and activities, whatever makes your life meaningful, you know, whether that's work or family relationships or baby kittens. Yeah. Cause you know, it's quiet. They just need someone to sleep on and be warm. It's, it is a lot of work, but it's a lot of intermittent work. So you can rest in between. Yeah. And when they're bigger, they just run around and pretty much take care of themselves. So I that's found so that good. that worked for my system and too, by being lonely, it made me feel less alone. Like I had, you know, I can't go out and talk to people, but like, I have something to take care of. Right, right, right. Oh my gosh. I just love hearing about your kittens and about the things that make life meaningful. And like, before we wrap up, yeah, they're so magical. We have to have maybe put some pictures in and then (gasps) before we wrap up, is there anything else you wanted to talk about on any of these topics? Yeah. So another, like a theme that we've had today is this trying to get away from discussions of like value and moral placement on things. And I want to end on talking about pain and a better way to talk about pain, because, you know, we try to give it that, that rating scale of a one to a 10, or they'll try to give it very specifics of like, well, this feels like a, that, and that feels like a, this of like, you know, you yeah. broke your arm. That's a six. You, I don't know, got in a horrible car accident. That's a 10. The, yeah. Getting away from that. And instead, the best pain descriptor uh, scale that I've ever had, it was on Tumblr. Thank you, Tumblr. Whoever made this, I don't know because there's no link to it uh, or um, to whoever created it. But it talks about pain as how much can you, how distracting is your pain and how much can you do? So, A 10 would be, I can't get out of bed. My pain is all that I can think about. I need like extreme intervention and probably headed to the ER. And then you keep going down from there. So like a four or five might be like, I'm pretty uncomfortable. I can do some of my work. I probably couldn't run errands, but I could sit quietly at home and watch TV, read a book, type on my computer. It's distracting, but I can manage. Whereas six, seven is you're like, I'm really... I'm get, I'm struggling to do things. I really need to go get my medication. Um, I, oh boy, you know, it's taking over what I can do. I probably need to start delegating tasks or start doing something else that where it's just, 
your ability to function. And it gets rid, rid of this like pain tolerance yeah, and right. pain threshold that I feel like people use incorrectly as a way to like, well, I have a high pain tolerance. And I'm like, okay, let's get rid of that. If you broke an arm, what can you do? Because it ends right. up leaving people to be like, well, I've had all of these things happen and I wouldn't give those a nine. But for me, this is a nine because I can't stand this. But like for me, a broken arm might be a six. It doesn't hurt that bad. And I know it will go away. This is right. going to be hours. Right. And I know how long right. this can go. And just, yes, better descriptors, better scales and work with patients to build these two. Oh, so true. And that's so you're really describing like how I was trained as an occupational therapist. It's like, you know, what does the client, the patient want and need to do in their life and how is their condition taken away from that? And then how can you either compensate or have adaptive like tools or like you mentioned, you know, taking forced rest breaks and stuff like that for fatigue and then, or how can we remediate it? And those are like the two options. You either, you make it better or you learn how to work around it. Like, and then, yes, yes. That's I mean, all you can do. Like simple. I mean, but, but, um, well, then you have the gray area where you're, yeah. you're like, well, I don't know how much better I can make this yesterday. I tried the time and I want to work, but today I tried it and it didn't, didn't, you know, yes. So it's hard, but no, I appreciate that. I think that's so helpful. I might try to find that. I have an old Tumblr. Called yeah, I can I send it to you if not, because I have them saved and I print it out oh. and I take it with me to appointments. I'm like, this is the pain scale I use and I refer to. That's so, because, I know. And I did have a doctor back to the gaslighting. I had a doctor, a pain doctor recently say, well, you have a job. So your pain can't be that bad. And I was like, that's not how my pain works. The extreme pain is intermittent. I have to go home it when I have that, or I'm like, but you're just saying that I work. So I'm fine. You have not seen how dirty my apartment is. The fact that I don't see my friends, I can't go home. I can't take trips. I can't run errands. I give all of my energy to work because, you know, I need that to keep my health insurance, to have a job. And because I care about the work that I do, but that's where it all goes. And that, yes, that one thing is not a uh, like a statement of success, you know, she has a job, so she's fine. No. Oh my gosh. Totally. You're getting punished for. Yes. For functioning. For functioning. That is so wrong. And I know I remember I, I, I had actually forgotten this, but I had a similar ish situation that I only found out when I was looking through old emails, trying to find something else that when I was having some stomach issues, but I didn't recognize that it was gastroparesis coming back. I thought that I had already, oh, of course, I thought I had fixed my gastroparesis, yeah. but anyway, so it was my first time realizing it could be intermittent. I thought it was kind of like either you, you know what yes. I mean? Yes. It's there or not. But anyway, so I, and that I said in my email to, um, my mom at the time, cause I was living in California, I said something like, well, the doctor says, since I'm not taking any, like, this makes no sense at all to me now, but anyway, it was, my stomach was really hurting. And they said, well, it's because I haven't taken any pain meds and it must not be that bad. That's like literally what the doctors had said. <laughs> like, who it's takes, just so dismissive. Who it takes doesn't... pain medication for a stomach? Or sorry, I'm not to dismiss anyone who does, but I'm like, I've never in my life taken a like a Tylenol for a stomach ache. Like to me, those are, that's for like other aches and pains. Yeah. Like, yeah. And people you know, do that. They'll make like, cause I yeah. do not take painkillers for ge- my general body aches. I let it go. Yeah. I say, excuse me. I say those for when the pain is so severe or when the body yeah. aches, I just can't yeah. stand them. And I am nearly in tears because it's just so overwhelming. Yeah. But again, too, if you put people into a comfortable environment, so let's think of like, yeah a work office versus a home office, a work office, you might not be in the most comfortable chair. You're probably at a hard table. You have Mm -hmm. no control over the air. You have no control over smells. Maybe you don't have a door. Maybe it's loud or too quiet and you cannot adjust your body to be comfortable or to take rest breaks. But like compared to like a work from home situation, I'm sitting on a Sherpa blanket. I can have my heat pad plugged in on me mm-hmm. all times. Mm-hmm. If I need food, I can step over and just grab something really quick. I can, if I need a break, I can go sit on my couch for 20 minutes and get comfortable. I can control my, the clothing I'm wearing can be soft and comfortable that right. I hope we will come as a workforce society to get better at allowing people to have bodies and to take care of those bodies. Because I too, like with clothing, I have realized for my RA that I don't think I can ever go back to wearing something like jeans or or like pants with a zip up and a 
non-elastic. I wear all loose, loose, loose clothing. Cause I was I putting on clothing from high school and I was home and I was like, how did I ever wear this? This hurts so bad. Oh, no. that, oh, yes. Allowing that. I think we can bring these classist ideas of professionalism and what looks and is professional down and let people be more comfortable because more comfort can be more productive. In oh my gosh, 100%. all ways. That's what I'm hoping that the pandemic has brought to workplaces, but we'll, we'll see. I think um, it'll be a battle for a while, touch and go. It and seems to be so far. And following who does what and kind of looking like, all right, Google, what are you doing? Well, yeah. okay. What are you doing? What are you doing? Right. And we right. need people well, to just take the lead. Yeah, this is, oh, I could talk to you forever. And so I think we'll have to do yeah, this. Like this has been wonderful. But thank you so much again, especially I mean, given how much you've been going through, I know you really recently, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's so, I'm so glad that you are having, you know, a relative good day. This is a good you. day. This yeah. is a good day. Yeah. Tomorrow, who knows? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, learning how to live with that uncertainty has just been so difficult, but important. Yeah. It's exhausting. It's exhausting. Yeah. But I'm so glad you, you spent your spoons on this podcast. Yes, <laughs> I, I sure did. That. Yeah. It's important and, to me too. And I'll put your, whatever contact information you'd like for people to have if they, if you want. Yeah. To. I would love full. I would love to hear from people. I I'm not always the best at responding right now because it is sometimes overwhelming yeah. to write back about medical things, yeah. but I still want people to reach out to me because I want to find others like me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm happy to also to make more individual connections. Cause you know, I post on Reddit, but no one so. knows who it is. And I would love to know other people and that I can also be your friend because, oh, I get it. I get it. Oh, thank you. So I'll put all your links in in the show notes. Yes. Great. But thank you so much. Yes. All right. Have a great evening.